What's going on? My name is Christian Baker. Alex Rowland has post another incredible short story about the Chiefs defense now leading up to the conference championship game tomorrow between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Baltimore Ravens. Now, I'm trying to figure out what he means by a nightmare. And he said literal nightmare. The Chiefs defense is a literal nightmare. What? What? In my Drewski voice, what do you mean by that? What, what, what do you mean by that? So we about to figure out what he means by that. <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? Let's see what Thing you got to say. For a quarterback <laughs> quite as devastating as an unblocked free rusher flying full speed with you directly in his sights. When you begin your drop, everything gets thrown into complete disarray when you realize that one guy you never thought was coming is now coming with nobody there to stop him. This completely disrupts any offense, which is a big reason why the Chiefs defense ranks seventh in defensive DVOA, even though they barely have any star power at all. Their 73 unblocked pressures ranks first in the league, and Steve Spagnuolo's philosophy and scheme are huge reasons why. Today, we'll dive into the film to figure out what unblocked pressures ranks first star power at all. Their 73 unblocked pressures ranks first in the league, and Steve Spagnuolo- 73 unblocked pressures is ridiculous in the NFL when it comes, because think about the NFL, right? The biggest thing in the NFL is the preparation, right? The drastic, drastic amount of preparation, especially for you to be an elite quarterback, an elite offensive coordinator in the NFL Football League, it takes a lot of preparation. So you would think they would try to mitigate as many unblocked pressures as possible. That quarterback would see it. He would notice the tail of that linebacker that's coming in free. Possibly he's uh, leaning on his toes or maybe that sensor will call it out and they'll change the protection. Something of that nature. For them to have 73 unblocked pressures, there's something that they're doing in that office or in, the, in that film room and that in that defensive mind of their coordinator is it's it's yeah it's working it's clicking it's humming that's different that's different his philosophy and scheme are huge reasons why big time today we'll dive into the film to figure out what that that's not just talent that's that's that coordinator he's drumming something vicious up he's drumming something vicious up philosophy and overall scheme are, and then break down why they do what they do and how they implement them to wreak sheer and utter havoc. In a league where defenses have gotten lighter, quicker, faster, the Chiefs' defense has gotten heavier, stronger, slower. They pair this physical philosophy with positional versatility to accomplish all of the different things they want to do. They start a ton of their coverages with two high safeties, which makes it easier to disguise what they're doing. Too high has the advantage of taking away the deep ball, makes it easier to disguise coverages, but has the disadvantage of having one less guy against the run. When the Chiefs play cover two zone, one of their favorite coverages, which means there are two deep safeties, cause you're taking one of those defenders out of the box, you have the one less guy, which is where their physical nature must come into play. Having one less guy means if all seven blockers block all seven defenders, you have nobody extra to hit the running back. So, the defense should lose every time. That deep safety is coming from depth to smash the ball carrier, and a safety 12 yards off the ball versus almost any running back is an absolute mismatch, so the Chiefs have been forced to install a physical brand of football, and they have. Watch the techniques of each of the defensive linemen. A lot of schemes have their linemen run straight upfield in between the offensive line if they have enough guys in the box. So because the Chiefs don't, they have bigger dudes who hold the point of attack and don't try and win a field, they try and stay put. This is why Chris Jones has never finished crazy high in tackle. Ah, uh, interesting. So them staying put allows them to shut, like, it allows them to suffocate the rushing lanes by not driving up field, because what driving up field too much does, it creates rushing lanes. It creates open, pa open pathways for the quarterback to see things, quarterbacks to run through open lanes for the running back to make a move through and get to that second level quite easy. Now you're staying there almost in an offensive line mindset and then using this 
as protection to where like, boom, I got you, I got you, I got you. And then as soon as I see that running back, I shed you and I make the tackle. Now the quarterbacks and the running backs who are trying to find these rushing lanes are in a debacle. They don't know which way to go because everything seems to just be static. Everything just seems to be this large wall of big bodies. So where do I go? So now I'm just going to try something. And then at that and then at that same moment, you try something and that running back puts his foot in the ground. They shed him and they make a tackle. This that's that's incredible thinking and it obviously was strategic with replacing these more lanky athletic defenders that we're used to seeing with more heavy and stout defenders that are similar to the builds of an offensive lineman now because you need to take up more space to take up more of those rushing lanes and shed and make tackles now it's it's quite fascinating and quite incredible that they were able to strategically do this and manipulate their defense to it being one of their secret weapons in regarding to how they defend certain teams, right? All the way down to personnel, not like the philosophy, the, the personnel fit the philosophy, right? It's kind of beautiful how they scheme this out. For a loss every year, he's not flying upfield. However, the Chiefs as a team finished pretty high in TFLs. They were not. Like, look at that. This is perfect upfield. example. Look at this. However, look at this. The Chiefs as a team finished pretty they are the line of scrimmage is right here it was on the 25 for a loss every year he's not flying up line of scrimmage is on the 25 look at how far their defensive line is get however the chiefs as a team finished pretty high defensive line don't get for gonna get further back than the damn tw uh, 20 uh 24 and tfls and now what and then they just stop them right on the line of scrimmage they were ninth with 87 because of their other core philosophy positional versatility insane here they are in too high so russell wilson thinks he has the advantage in the box eight on eight because the chiefs are versatile they can roll their safety justin reed down to cover a receiver and create the advantage in the box and a minimal gain up the middle Typically, this is a zone tell with nobody walked out over the second receiver. And typically, you wouldn't want a safety covering a receiver, but that's what makes the Chiefs' defense so tricky to process and attack. The fact that they can get away with playing as much too high as they do and not get punished in the running game means they have all the advantages in the world in the passing game, and nobody can dial up insane too high coverages better than their defensive coordinator Steve Spagnuolo. He likes to start off the game in really basic cover two zone to lull the offense into a false sense of security for the rest of the game. Because they have the two deep safeties playing deep halves, the Chiefs can use their physical brand to bump the receivers to the line since the corners are playing underneath. This disrupts the timing of the offense while giving you protection over the top in case they whiff. And, oh yeah, sets up the Chiefs for all the stuff they want to do off these basic looks. You can see the Dolphins trying to stretch him deep early on. They try a play action pass to suck him up a bit. They don't bite. The corners can stay tight and minimize Hill and Waddle getting the top speed. And the safeties stay over the top, creating a nice safety net over the top. Now to get into some of the ways they get those unblocked pressures, cover zero is one of their main approaches. We've talked a lot about cover zero this year, damn near every week now. So not to sound like an absolute broken record here, but to quickly recap, it's straight man coverage, zero deep safeties, which is why it's called cover zero, but that means you get to rush one more defender than the offense can block. It's the ultimate do or die play for the defense, sack or touchdown, but the Chiefs are different because they disguise it so well, which makes it challenging to beat. As an offense, you want to throw quick hitting passes against cover zero, hoping you can break a tackle, then nobody will be there to stop your receiver. But pre-snap, this looks like zone coverage. Man has a guy- I mean, it looks like too high. For a guy, and cover zero almost never has these two safeties this deep, since you want to protect against those quicker hitters. Hell, this looks a ton like their normal cover two zone we just saw a minute ago with the mm -hmm. two deep, the bump exactly. corners. There's only four down linemen. That's a good bluff. Too many defenders close to the line. But look what happens after the snap. Tua has no idea he's getting a free runner, thinks he has all the time in the world, and then, boom, Karlaftis in your face. Tua knows pre-snap he is Devon Achan one-on-one with a linebacker, which is a good matchup. Achan is faster than hell, and depending on where the linebacker is inside or out, Achan has the option to break away from him. The only downside is this is a longer developing route, but against what Tua thinks is a one-on-one -on -one matchup with plenty of time, he can just wait but that does not work out. 
They just stay in these too high cover two looking coverages so often that they can consistently make educated gambles throughout the game which creates big plays. While these are extremely risky coverages, Spags has created a veil of security for the quarterback that he's fine, comfortable, can get through his now the question is is do they keep going with this side with this uh type of uh defense going into the conference championship game tomorrow or do they change it because it's such a big game and there's so much film on them that does the defensive coordinator get cold feet in regards to now i have to do something drastically different because of the impact of this game because of the stakes of this game and because of how much film they have on us what if they know my tales what if they know my tendencies or do they stick with this and they believe in it at its core this has been something that they've run all year it's been something that they've been molded to run specifically picked to run personnel wise and they run it so well that even if you know the tales they'll still be able to execute at a high level that's what i that's what i want to believe especially with a veteran defensive coordinator like steve spagnolia i want to believe that but there is a possibility that he's thinking alone in a dark room at night and he's like this is a big game i gotta do something different i gotta make sure we win and gets out of character who knows he's still human He's still human. You never know what those chances are, right? Everybody gets into their head at some point. I would I would suspect that that high of a level, though, with that type of veteran experience, I think he stays calm, cool, collective. And he believes in the system that he creates, and he believes in the fact that they've ran it all season. They've done really well at running it to a certain point where they might make, of course, a few adjustments in regards to the team that they're playing. But the scheme probably stays the same. The philosophy probably still stays the same. But just throwing it out there, giving a different perspective, you never know. This is still a human being at the end of the day, right? Hell breaks loose. When they're not running cover zero, they still have unique ways to get that coveted unblocked pressure on the quarterback. You'll see this looks exactly like the other coverages. Too high, corners bumping at the line, only two for three. But here they just rush four, including their slot corner, and still get the unblocked pressure and a sack. This is because of the wild schematic irregularity Spags deploys, where they have Chris Jones and George Karlaftis to the left, are blitzing Trent McDuffie, but the Eagles have three linemen of their own, three for three, but they still let the pressure fly through unblocked. This is because Spags is in his absolute bag, where he calls a TE tackle end stunt, where Chris Jones penetrates outside so Karlaftis can loop inside, but also still has McDuffie coming off the edge. This is unconventional, because you're putting two defenders in one gap, which is frowned upon. They could run into each other, it gives Hurts an additional rushing lane, but here, even though the Eagles slide three towards that side, Lane Johnson, who gives up sacks as often as the Detroit Pistons win basketball games, doesn't see this coming, and McDuffie gets the sack. That's crazy. Gives up more sacks than the, D the Detroit Pistons win basketball games is crazy. That's crazy. You in your bag right now, Alex. You in your bag. I see you. Not only does this scheme utilize these crazy pressure packages, but in general, even if the Chiefs aren't getting the unblocked guy, the coverage disguises are just hard to parse through post-snap for the quarterback, which is another reason why the Chiefs have been so good on defense, despite really only having Chris Jones as a star. First off, they can just straight up double two of your best receivers in man coverage, so you're forcing an offense to beat you with their three or four which just not a lot of teams have three guys like that. And then they can start mixing up all the stuff they do with their safeties, which causes giant headaches. Another coverage they can mix in from too high is cover two man. Watch how they start to roll down a safety into the middle, showing it's one high, implying it's cover one man, where one man has its defenders play outside leverage to force the receiver inside to their underneath help. The Dolphins run a ton of inbreakers, it's their bread and butter, and Tua has two, but as he motions the running back, watch Mike Edwards. He rotates into two high. Oh, that's I a beautiful have never disguise. Seen a team start in two, roll to one, and then go back, back to two. two. That's, that's crazy. Exactly what happens? Steve's yeah. in his bag. Steve's in his duffel and his Louie. Oh shit! As the Chiefs have his positional versatility. Oh, that's crazy. And Reed, he and Legarius Need can switch responsibilities. And in two man, instead of playing outside oh, to force the receiver bluff. in. You're That's inside to force well, a receiver out, because look at where the safeties are. Tua gets confused, gets spooked, and throws wildly over the middle when his precious inbreakers are taken away. 
This defense just has so many different looks they can cycle through. Quarterbacks are constantly guessing, processing after the snap, which always leads to bad play and mistakes. They're in too high again, but now they roll to one, and they keep one deep, except for the fact McDuffie, the cornerback, now rolls deep into two. The positional versatility allows corners to play safety or vice versa. Anybody at any time can drop deep, blitz, drop underneath, anything can happen. They can start. They really had to go deep on their personnel. They had to be very specific with the type of players that they chose. They couldn't just pick traditional linebackers. They had to pick, pick linebackers that could cover slots. They had to pick linebackers that could potentially roll back, play deep. They had to pick safeties that could roll down in the box and play strong. They had to pick corners that could play nickel as well as corner, maybe even free. They had to pick guys that could be versatile, do almost anything on that defense. That's incredible. That's incredible. Like this, this goes way back to draft. This goes way back to free agency and then philosophy, implementation, execution, and film. This took a lot of steps to get to this point, and they and now they humming. Now they humming. Started in one high and rolled a two. You can see how the inside leverage screws with what the Dolphins are trying to do here. And then they can also play this weird, ominous three deep coverage where they drop two guys into what coaches call a double buzz concept and take care of anything over the middle. In a year where the Chiefs offense has dipped a bit, the defense has been there to pick up the slack. Spags has slowly built this unit over the past five seasons, and this 2023 version is easily his best. He's developed lesser talent over the years by molding them into the philosophy he's installed in Kansas City, power and versatility. Through dominating in the trenches with power and with physical corners, he's limited the run game and beaten up timing-based offenses. And through versatility, he's deployed a scheme that has quarterbacks guessing every which way because they can never get a beat on anything. The Chiefs have a tall task on Sunday to take down the Ravens, a team that can beat you in every which way versus a defense designed to do the exact same. <laughs> this Isn't that a beautiful matchup? We have now a game, an AFC Conference Championship game, in, in a Ravens offense that is bolstering with, ta with, with talent and philosophy and scheme and just makes the perfect fit between all the things Lamar does well, right? And now this, uh, now he's grown into the type of quarterback that is almost impossible to defend. And he's got the type of pieces around him that kind of makes that offense almost impossible to defend. And then you have this Kansas City defense with this incredible defensive coordinator, Steve Spagnuolo, and these molded players under his philosophy for over five years into one of the greatest defenses that he's coached in the Kansas City era against probably the greatest this Lamar Jackson offense has looked in the Lamar Jackson era. And you have this what we say is impossible offense to defend with what we also can see is one of the most stout defenses. It's kind of a beautiful, it's not even kind of, it's one, it's a, it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story. I am more excited for this game than I am for that 49ers game, if I'm honest with you. I think the 49ers are going to win. And I don't know if it's going to be by a lot, but I think they're going to win. This game between Lamar and Patrick, I don't know who's going to win, but I know I want Lamar to win. And the fact that I don't know what to win, don't know who's going to really win, is why I'm so excited to watch this game. I'm so excited to watch this game. And I have not yet decided if I'm going to watch it and do a kind of recap review of the game and just like how I felt during the game. Or am I going to not watch it and then react to the highlights with you guys uh, uh, about this game? I'm not sure because I really I really want to watch this game. I want to watch it live with my friends, too. So we'll see, though. But I'm pretty dedicated to this whole YouTube thing. I'm back in it full swing. Uh you know, and everything. So I'll probably just end up watching the highlights with you guys. You know what I mean? So other than that, though, wow. I did not know some of these things about this defense. It makes it, it makes this, hey, it makes this game, it makes this matchup a lot more interesting.